My name is Aaron Gerds. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of ASH Clinical News. And I'm joined today by Dr. Heaney, who presented at this ASH annual meeting about crizanlizumab, hard for me to say, well done. Uh, <laughs> in sickle cell disease. So thank you for joining me today. It's a pleasure. Pleasure. To, pleasure to speak with you. So crizanlizumab, how does it prevent veno-occlusive crises in patients with sickle cell disease? So in sickle cell disease, um, those patients with the highest white blood cell counts seem to have the most frequent vaso-occlusive pain. And crizanlizumab is a monoclonal antibody specific for P-selectin. Now P-selectin is expressed on activated platelets and on activated endothelium. And so those white blood cells, which contain the binding partner for P-selectin called PSLG1, those white cells can bind to the endothelium more readily or bind to platelets and make platelet uh, leukocyte aggregates. And it's felt that those will increase the likelihood of a vaso-occlusive event occurring. So it's a logical target uh, to go after. Very logical, and boy, you could almost say we could use it in other diseases like, say, MPNs, where there's a higher risk of thrombosis and associated with elevated white cell and platelet cell counts, which is kind of interesting uh, from my perspective. Yes. So, um, so, crizanlizumab, it's already approved, correct? So it's approved in adults uh, yeah. over the age of 16, uh, adolescents and adults, yeah. and so this trial was looking at younger age groups. Of course. Uh, we're hoping to have these uh, treatments that are effective available to younger age groups. So this is a pharmacoequivalence trial, if you will, to look at not only the safety um, at progressively lower dose cohorts, or age cohorts, pardon me, um, but also to confirm the dose and make sure there's no added uh, safety signal. Okay. So kind of extending the, the bar down to younger and younger patients. Indeed, and so this first group that we presented here was just the age 12 okay. up to less than 18. Okay. And if that uh, goes well, then we'll go further down. So the, the plan age is towards. to get even younger patients. Yeah. Well, Once the pharmacoequivalency is shown and safety, then we'll go younger. Would you suspect, you know, based on, on the experience with this trial and comparing it to prior trials, is there an advantage for moving this therapy at a younger and younger age? Well, it's interesting you say that. I mean, I think that there is certainly the uh, expression of P-selectin on the endothelium and on platelets, uh, no matter what the age. But there are people who believe there's sort of an accumulative. Um, endothelial dysfunction or endothelial injury that potentially uh, could result in maybe even higher expression and therefore maybe even better benefit in an older patient, but that's not really been shown. So you mentioned that this is a, a kind of a treatment equivalent uh, where you're looking at side effects and efficacy with different, slightly different doses in a slightly different population. Right. So um, what were the most common adverse events that you, you saw in your trial? Well, so in that first age cohort from 12 to less than 18, we actually used the same dose okay. as in adults and that was actually confirmed. So it's five milligrams per kilogram per dose. Um, and the main adverse events that were really very similar, uh, comparable to the sustained trial, the adult trial. Uh, but the most common were about 20% uh, had back pain, 20% had headache, and around that same uh, region um, also had some gastrointestinal effects, nausea, vomiting. Okay. Do a large number of patients have to come off study due to adverse events? Actually, um, none uh, stopped related to, to adverse okay. events from this. There were only uh, about, uh, I think it was 12% serious adverse events and oh, none nice. higher than grade three. So as <laughs> unlike some of the other trials we've talked about uh, over the course of the meeting, so this does actually sound like it's pretty well tolerated. It is uh, pretty well tolerated, certainly in the study. And, and uh, you know, there's now more experience of the drug in adults. There's um, uh, ex uh, extra special close uh, look at infusion-related reactions. Um, there were about 8% of those in, in this study, and I think in the real world, now that this yeah. drug is approved, um, there have been some case reports of other infusion-related reaction reactions, but the, the sponsor is, is very interested in making sure that they can see that safety signal if yeah. it's there. Excellent. So, you know, ex you know, pretty good safety profile. What would you say, uh, how effective is this at preventing these, uh, uh, these pain crises? Yeah, so in the initial sustained trial, and again um, now in the, the Silas Kids trial, um, it's about a 50% uh, reduction, if you will, in the number of vaso-occlusive crises and the number of uh, visits to the hospital or to the emergency room. So they talk about a median annualized rate of overall VOC going from 3 to 1.6, and the visits to a hospital or emergency room, the median annualized rate going from 4 to 1.4. So, that's, you know, about a 50% reduction, if you will. Um, I'm sure the statisticians won't like me using a percentage for a median reduction, but nonetheless, it seems to cut it in about half. Cut in half, that's Which is about what we see with hydroxyurea and about what was also shown with Indari. So certainly disease modifying, yeah. although not a curative uh, yeah. uh, treatment. Well, excellent. And, d and don't worry, you're among friends, not statisticians here. <laughs> so, um, uh, so, so pretty e effective as well. Um, and you mentioned disease modifying. Uh, you, you know, is there any expectation that this may alter disease course long term? Well, that would be the hope. I think yeah. that we, we know that in patients who have frequent uh, vaso-occlusive crises tend to have uh, 
uh, shortened lifespan or, or worsened mortality. So I think that ultimately that's the, that's the idea. So they've chosen an endpoint of pain, which is meaningful to the patient and sort of immediate, whereas others have tried to take a more long-term preventative mortality type approach, and that's obviously harder to prove in a short trial. So um, I think uh, overall the, the, the sponsor seems interested in looking at other endpoints, uh, oh, other excellent. organs. So uh, right now they're open trials uh, looking at uh, kidney function, at priapism, and uh, we'll see what, what comes out of those. But hopefully other protection of end organs will be, will be demonstrated. Okay, yes. More of a practical question: How, How's this administered, and, and how you know, how easy is it to give this type of treatment? Yeah, so it's a monoclonal antibody, so it's given IV. Mm -hmm. um, there are two uh, loading doses given two weeks apart, and then it's a monthly infusion. It's about over 30 minutes, um, and so it's really easily accomplished in most hematology infusion centers. And uh, um, infusion-related reactions are pretty uncommon. These uh, AEs and, and uh, SAEs are fairly low. Uh, most of them are gone within 24 hours of the, of the dose, and most of them are easily, at least the pain, the back pain, and so forth, easily uh, with supportive care and, and uh, non-opioid interventions well, fantastic. helpful. Wow, I mean, a, a pretty complete package there in terms of you know, tolerability and efficacy and easy deliverability, too. Um, yep. I guess, you know, to kind of sum things up, what is the one thing that gets you most excited about this therapy as, you know, it's moved into the clinics now for certainly people, older patients and hopefully for younger patients too in the future? You know, what, what gets you most excited about it? Well, I think what gets me excited is that the pathophysiology of sickle cell yeah. disease is so complex. There's so many aspects uh, that are involved in leading to the final phenotype. And so we have hydroxyurea, which is fetal hemoglobin induction and also myelosuppression. And uh, we also think that because the white cells are so important, the myelosuppression could only be added by uh, reducing the stickiness of the yeah. white cells with the P-selectin inhibition. And so I think as we look at other new therapies uh, attacking other parts of the pathophysiologic process, my hope ultimately is that additive therapy, um, you know, much like any success we had in cancer yeah. chemotherapy was in multi-agent use. I think ultimately that's where we're going. But, you know, sadly, that's not how we develop or approve drugs in this country. So um, we'll probably have to rely on federal and NIH dollars yeah. to help us do those combinatorial yeah. therapies. Well, hopefully, certainly efforts like the ASH is doing with advocacy will help move things forward too. And on a personal note, I just think this is so exciting because I remember as a fellow learning about like how important white cell and white cell adhesion was in, in you know, thrombosis and occlusion crises in sickle cell disease. And that was kind of uh, kind of a, a light bulb moment I remember from my fellowship. So it's it's amazing to see that actually applied in a practical sense for patients. We're we're equally excited. It's uh, never would have thought we'd be in a point where we'd have to prioritize clinical trials for patients <laughs> or or uh, have uh, choices in our therapies. So it's it's hopeful, and uh, that's really what we're trying to give is hope and and uh, yeah. benefit as well. All good news for sure. Well, thank you. Well, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank my you pleasure. so much for viewing. Um, if you want to read the abstract, it's available at the, on, at the Blood Journal website as well as our coverage through Ash Clinical News. Dr. Hemi, thanks again so much. It's been a pleasure. My pleasure, too.